Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for being being here, and thank you to uh, Namla for your very kind introduction. Uh, it's it's a real honour to be here at the inaugural conference of this association, and to have seen all of the work and all of the energy behind its establishment over the past years, and to have been part of some of the conversations in a. Um, from an outside perspective, commenting on what had been a, a successful in the establishment of our Australasian Association for Digital Humanities and, and how it's helped to bring together entirely new communities of research and practice from entirely different disciplines around this framing topic of digital humanities that has such a capacity to connect people and which involves the application of new technologies and computing in research but also the study of the effects of those in society. And I think this bridge building um, aspect of digital humanities is becoming much more apparent uh, than in earlier phases of this field's development when it was primarily um, focused on the technological transfer into the humanities of concepts in computer science and in, and in the sciences. But now, at least half of the papers at major international conferences are also looking at the effects of, of that transfer and what sorts of new knowledge it can be produced, can be produced and, and how that is informing theory, critical theory across multiple disciplines from the literary and historical studies to cultural studies and also to computer science itself because it is posing to computer science new kinds of challenges, new sorts of data and uh, new kinds of um, methods giving it to a new sort of relevance in this hybrid space of digital humanities. So I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be here to speak to you today on this topic of the tyranny of being digital, being human in the digital age. My background is as a literary scholar who was drawn into history and media studies and uh, in the last few years I've been particularly interested in biography and in identity and ultimately also in the effect that the digital age is having on us as humans in terms of who, how we see ourselves in an increasingly connected world but also how uh, traditional practices of biographical scholarship and identity studies are being uh, affected by this major digital turn which we're all part of. innovations in information technology and computing have been proliferating with breathtaking speed. Global digital connectivity has triggered a transformation whose impact is greater than that of any other innovation in the history of technologies of communication. Digital systems and communication networks have dramatically reshaped the way that we relate to each other, how we perceive ourselves, what we value, and the ways that we interact with the world around us. They're penetrating every corner of our daily lives, influencing our physical, mental, and ethical behaviors. They're changing the way that we think, the way we talk and write, and as they do this, they're changing our understandings of self, nation, and the world. So these digital technologies are not only transforming the world we inhabit, but they're transforming us. They're recoding us to see differently and behave differently. Proliferating information online is one of the most visible manifestations of 21st century globalization. Even those without access to the internet are affected in, the world, in that the world that they inhabit is increasingly controlled, regulated and monitored using digital, digital technologies. There's little of our world that remains unaffected on a global scale. Think about it. Satellite navigation systems, transport and logistics infrastructure, financial markets and banking systems, including new digital cryptocurrencies, digitally based user driven business models, online political campaigns, e government and open data, medical robots and health data records, environmental sensing and outer space exploration, they're all 
affected and fundamentally informed by and enabled by various forms of advanced digital technologies. Even wars are enacted through the internet via cyber attacks, automatic defence networks, drone strikes and digital surveillance. And now we live with early forms of machine learning and artificial intelligence, even in some people's homes, via smart devices and systems. All these examples have in common the capacity to perform ever more complex functions at ever higher levels of speed and efficiency and with less and less direct humans, human hands-on involvement. Screens place a distance between us and all kinds of activities. And yet, paradoxically, in another sense, they've conquered distance. The live streaming applications that are available through smart televisions uh, so, and or services such as YouTube carry endless streams of music, movies and videos into people's homes or onto their devices wherever they happen to be if they have access to this technology. But what effect is all of this having on us? We are caught up and swamped by an endless intoxicating stream of information, on-demand entertainment, online marketing, and social connectedness that seems to be self-generating and self-replenishing. In describing its effects, both Polish sociologer, sociologist and philosopher Zygmunt Bauman coined the term liquid life, partly to describe the disorienting effects of all of these pressures in modern society. But to use another current term, technology is disrupting familiar norms and established practices in every sphere of life. By 1950, by some estimates, human knowledge was doubling every 25 years. Now, I'm not sure how these things are calculated, and I'm always a bit sceptical about these kinds of statistics that talk about mass um, effects of, in, in terms of knowledge um, growth. What is knowledge? How is it recorded? How should we understand um, the development of, of knowledge of human society and how can we measure it? I would like to see how these calculations have been done. But nevertheless, they're pointing to a world where, um, according to some other statistics, that doubling of human knowledge has now been reduced to 14 months. In less than a decade, largely thanks to our internet interconnected de uh, devices, the sum total of human knowledge could be doubling every day. I think what they're pointing to is uh, human knowledge being uh, having an equivalent data itself and the amount of data available that is being generated. The fact that we can capture and store it now is what is enabling this store of information to be to be measured and for us to see it as, as doubling so quickly. And, and how much actual new knowledge is being generated by this 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 data and this vast data is another question we may wonder whether some knowledge could be better produced by the limiting data or focusing on quality or and a whole different discussion to have. Feeding on this huge store with which we as individuals engage every day are the predatory search engines that create the rising wave of data that's harvested from public and private digital interactions. On an average day, we're told, human beings generate 2.5 million, oh, sorry, 2.5 trillion bytes of of data. So what is this doing to us? What does it mean to be human in the digital age? How are identities and behaviours changing and what kinds of future does this point towards? In this talk, with these questions in mind, I look back over the past few remarkable decades of digital innovation to the present day. We're in the midst of a data revolution that's penetrated much of the world's population so suddenly and deeply that it's almost impossible to fully grasp the extent of its impact on concepts of self and identity in the digital world. However, an important part of it is a changing experience of distance in people's relationships with places, with memories, with knowledge, with things and each other. Mass connectivity has, for many people, removed the traditional restrictions to communication that were posed by geography. All kinds of borders, physical 
physical and conceptual have been broken down by the internet. And as this has progressively occurred, we as users have generally seen it as a positive, liberating and exciting uh, development. The world has been redrawn, writes the internet critic Andrew Keane, as a distributed network. It's becoming evident that we too are being redrawn as human beings and as citizens. And in one sense, this signals an unprecedented, an unprecedented level of freedom. Yet embracing the new capacity for human connectivity has negative as well as social repercussions, especially for individual privacy and also for how we interact with each other. The demand to be connected and continuously open to others to enjoy the benefits of connectivity opens us up to surveillance, control and commercial exploitation. On our own personal, our own personal boundaries are able to be penetrated. By embracing connectivity so warmly and putting our trust in it, we're also becoming its willing and obedient victims. And in any unequal or uh, trusting power relationship, by offering up ourselves to Google and other data giants that prowl behind our screens, we've created a fertile ground for a new kind of power to be unleashed and a new tyranny to take hold. And the source of this power, until now, has been a capacity for largely unfettered digital data collection and data mining. But just last week, on Friday, 25th of May, was, there was a historic uh, day that was uh, and a marker when the European Union General Data Protection Regulation came into effect after four years of preparation. This is a regulation in EU law on data protection and privacy for all individuals within the European Union and in the European Economic Area. But it also addresses the export of personal data outside of Europe. Uh, the reason this is so important is that GDPR is an ambitious set of rules that requires transparency for users about what data is being collected and why. According to a, a GDPR compliance expert, quoting from a recent article, quote, for many years it's been a case of how much data can we trick people into giving us and we'll figure out how to use it later. Um, that's not going to be an acceptable way to operate anymore under the GDPR. But he explains that some companies openly say, quote, are you kidding? If we told them what we were doing with their data, they'd never give it to us in the first place, unquote. This is from a, a compliance expert. And you may have received emails from companies and from lists in the last few days or last weeks that, that have asked you to opt out or opt back <coughs> into certain services or have or otherwise uh, shown links to updated privacy information. Uh, I was recently playing a game on my phone as I took off on the aeroplane here, Subway Surf, my favourite games. I don't play many games, but that one I enjoy, particularly on planes, because you can just play it for a short time and uh, get distracted from the activity of taking off on, on the aeroplane. And I, unless I agreed to all of these complex terms and conditions, uh, which seemed to involve advertising to third parties and all sorts of other things that I've never seen before when I turned this game on, then it wouldn't let me play the game. And I, I, I reluctantly agreed, and I had a go, and then I, and then I opted out, because actually I thought, I don't want all of my data being, being shared for advertising purposes with any number of other companies in the days and shows. Anyway, this, this is the kind of um, situation that, that this new law is designed to keep in, in check. We didn't see this coming more, maybe perhaps we didn't want to see it, this, this violation. It's been an unwelcome side effect of the removal of barriers and the abolition of distance that have generally been viewed as, viewed as positive characteristics of the connected digital world. But in addition to the loss of privacy, there's another penalty to pay for the gifts and freedoms offered by the digital communication technologies that we've embraced. They're so difficult to resist that the level of digital media uh, is, use is widely considered now to be an addiction that has quickly reached epidemic proportions worldwide. In a recent article, uh, 
Jacob Weisberg cites the findings of a British study indicating that people check their phones 220 times a day, on average once every 4.3 minutes. The title has the article has the title Overdose. And yet the very first touch screen smartphones only went on sale uh, 11 years ago, almost to the day it's the, the first iPhone in June 2007. Our transformation en masse into device people has happened very suddenly. One effect, of course, is that we see everywhere is the effect on, on young people of, of always on connectivity. And it has shown to have an effect in terms of them retreating from unmediated conversation. As Sherry Turkle reports in a recent book called Reclaiming the Conversation of the Power of Talk in a Digital Age, 2018, young people are no longer learning the age old skill of interacting through speech, and this is degrading not only the quality of spoken language but also of human relationships. She quotes one young person saying, quote, I never really learned how to do a good job of talking in person. Even when I'm with my friends, I'll go on online to make a point. I'm much more at home that way. Unquote. The social media sets up a distance between self and others. But there are many other effects that we're aware of and we can see them every day around us. The history of the development of computers goes right back to the first experiments by the likes of Charles Babbage, an English mechanical engineer who pioneered the concept of a programmable computer in the early 19th century. As in the case of most computers prior to the internet era, his analytical engine was designed for performing calculations, not for communication or information sharing. Very few people used or even saw such machines. For many people in developed countries, their first encounter with computers was in the 1980s, when desktop computers entered the mainstream in businesses and sometimes even the home. These were not yet communication devices, although they were starting to be linked on localised networks. During the same period, something was quietly happening that would start the digital revolution. The network we now know of as the internet was being established. The internet was originally conceived of for military or research purposes and only at first connected a limited number of sites in the US. But it wasn't long before the hypertext protocol and the World Wide Web were established and new nodes worldwide opened the system to users across the globe, albeit still only a privileged few of the access. If we compare the late 20th century when personal computers and the early web appeared with the second decade of the 21st century, one of the greatest differences is that the specialist computing power that was only available to a very small number of people almost entirely in the domain of the sciences is now within easy reach of most researchers and even the general public. The supercomputers of the last century have been progressively compressed and miniaturized to such an extent that their equivalents now fit, in, fit into devices that we can hold in the palm of our hands. It was in the 1990s that the first laptops became readily available. By the turn of the century, there was much discussion of technological convergence of telephony, computing, and traditional media channels such as TV and radio. They represented another kind of collapse of space and distance. All this has now happened, and we live in a time of truly ubiquitous computing. Our devices are designed to be always on, and so too is society, constantly connected. People experience separation anxiety when they're at a distance from their phone. Perhaps some of you are feeling it now while it's turned off in your pocket. <laughs> Another major change is that sophisticated software and devices that didn't yet exist or were extraordinarily expensive are now often available freely of charge. Free of charge. At the beginning of the 21st century, there were approximately 350 million people connected to the internet across the world. But by the end of the first decade, this number had increased to more than 2 billion. 
by the end of 2017, it was over 4 billion at, la at last count. During the same period, mobile phone subscriptions skyrocketed from 750 million to over 7 billion worldwide. According to a 2016 Ericsson Mobility Report, over 90% of the world's population will be covered by mobile broadband networks by 2021. If this momentum is maintained, most of the Earth's projected population of 8 billion people will be online by 2025, with remarkable social consequences and opportunities. It's not only humans who are caught up in this global web of digital connectivity, but also an exponentially expanding number of intelligent devices in what's known as the Internet of Things. There will be around 30 billion connected intelligent devices by 2020. In last year, for the first time, the number of smart devices was greater than the world's population. Like people, these machines are talking to each other, participating in a global data fest, or what Andrew King refers to as an electronic panopticon that produces and circulates information about our world and ourselves in a never-ending stream everywhere, all the time. And it's astonishing how quickly this world-transforming phenomenon has been accepted as normal and routine. Everyday digital technologies take a firmer hold on the basic systems that underlie the functioning of modern global societies. In the early years of the 21st century, from around 2004, social media entirely reconfigured human interactions on a global scale. Web 1, as it's sometimes retrospectively referred to, had created new kinds of communities. But Web 2 took this further to create, as Van Dyke puts it in the classic book, The Culture of Connectivity from 2009. Quote, interactive two-way vehicles for networked sociality. Unquote. And this led to entirely new forms of mass communication and changing of collective social behaviours. These vehicles offered new modalities for public and private expression and exposure and opened up possibilities and dangers that have been multiplied ever since. The scale and the reach of social media networks is daunting. By 2012, Facebook alone was reported as having over 1 billion public users and now has over 2 billion monthly active users or close to a third of the world's population. In one generation, we've gone from having practically no access to unfiltered information to having boundless, free and instantaneous public access to vast networks of online user-generated data and to be able to contribute to them. Citizen journalism has led to greater openness to immediate reporting from multiple non-official or censored viewpoints. Crowdsourcing, a term coined in 2006 by Wired writer Jeff Powell, harnesses the collective power of multiple users or actors in systems or networks. But the same power of the crowd also enables crowdfunding and other forms of what, of what we might think of as collective intelligence or connected action. The same collective energy can also be directed at social issues. With a powerful enough message, marketers, activists, politicians and lobbyists can summon vast audiences in a matter of minutes, swaying mass public opinion. The breaking of news by the likes of WikiLeaks even has the power to affect financial markets globally. The collective power of social media to mobilise social action was demonstrated memorably in the Arab Spring in 2010 and other mass activism since giving collectives and communities a voice that was not previously possible. The recent Me Too movement has shown the power of ground up social media to expose and bring down celebrities who once dominated the one-way communication channels of traditional broadcast media. This is an image that I, I always like to refer to in, in in talks about digital identity, because um, it's a powerful reminder of, of uh, changing social context. In 2006, Time magazine named its Person of the Year as You, 
on the front cover of the special issue devoted to this theme, uh, the magazine announced, you, yes you, you control the information age. Welcome to your world. Time had earlier celebrated the computer as the person of the year in 1982. And here I'm picturing on the left the cover from uh, 1983 when the computer was named as the machine of the year. Time was signalling in 2006 a global trend toward deep integration of data and algorithmic culture into our lives with the rise of social media. But there was a hidden sting in social media that liberated and empowered you has sacrificed its privacy. Nancy K. Miller, writing at the start of the century, described this as, quote, a paroxysm of personal exposure, making the private public, unquote. At that time, much was written about the multiplicity of identity, people living second lives online, the duplicity of living different online and offline selves. Now, our concept of social identity is needed to expand, to include a new kind of distributed self that's given form in online environments. As Bill Thompson writes, quote, our modern conception of privacy and of the nature of the individual is a product of the industrial age that's now passing. So it should not surprise us that we find a new way of constructing an online identity. People also reveal themselves online in ways that they may not do so in front of others. They, they expose their vulnerabilities and secrets. The power in Google data, it has been claimed, is that people tell the giant search engine things that they might not tell anyone else. That's from a beautiful recent book that I've been reading called Everybody Lies, which I recommend. Nowadays, we routinely forgive sports stars or celebrities who send out compromising or even offensive tweets. Indeed, it appears only to enhance their profile. Perhaps it's even become an expected dimension of their personality online. The US has a president who sends out unplanned tweets as a matter of course. <laughs> Could this simply be the logical endpoint of a process of acceptance <coughs> initiated more than a decade ago that the price we pay for our global instant communications environment is the exposure of our, our private lives in their instantaneousness and spontaneousness into the public domain. Controversial as it once was, the, the, the revelation in public of intimate personal information or opinions no longer seems as freeing, nor in some cases quite as sinister as it once did. We're even learning to ignore Trump's knee-jerk reactions and announcements and see them for what they are, part of the daily internet chatter. In all these cases, the distance between the concepts of public and private has been so reduced as to be almost one and the same. At the same time as accessing the vast realm of accumulating and circulating data via our network <coughs> devices, we're also clicking that, or contributing to it rather with every click or touch adding bits and pieces of ourselves. Our pasts are becoming etched like a tattoo into our digital skins, wrote J.D. Lassica in 1998. Developments relating to online identity and privacy have progressively borne out his provocative assertion. Over decades of engagement with the internet, individual users will each have generated by default an extensive and enduring digital life narrative. They will have, quote, accumulated and stored a comprehensive online narrative of all facts and fictions, every misstep and every triumph spanning every phase of life. And so these visions from J.D. Massacre were, were prophetic coming from 20 years ago that have been born out. With the exponentially accelerating use of digital technologies and mass adoption of social media that followed after Time's pronouncement in 2006 that you control the information age, freedom and power did indeed, uh, for a while at least, seem to shift towards the individual. However, there was a long shadow looming over this scene. While this new world appeared to be a cornucopia, it also proved to be a minefield. This 
sense of empowerment that's been progressively undermined by a growing realisation that more may be taken than given every time we use the web. Over a decade later, it appears that this highly personalised but faceless information environment now ceaselessly shapes us. As millions of users logged into smartphones, vast new data sets began to be generated continually, producing big data on the movement and behaviour of people on an unprecedented scale, forming vast archives of potential data mining and matching. This opened the possibility for sophisticated mapping of data points and transactions simultaneously on the micro and macro scale. Digital data, it has been suggested, may be our era's microscope or telescope. It's another idea that's come from that book, Everybody Lies. And it relates actually to a fundamental way of thinking about digital humanities as a field. Uh, I once saw a beautiful uh, lecture by Jeffrey Schnapp, um, the Harvard professor in Germany at uh, the Volkswagen uh, Foundation, which sponsors major digital humanities conferences. And it opened with an image of a new kind of camera which can, can focus both near and far at the same time. And I thought that, and he was making the point that this was a wonderful um, example of a, of a, of a, of a metaphor for um, how digital humanities is interested in both the in individual data points and experiences or, or instances in a system as in uh, sometimes referred to as close reading apps in the less leisure context as well as the macro big picture of big data that's practically unreadable or can't even be thought of without understanding it in terms of patterns and flows of information. So digital data may be our here as a microscope or telescope. As we traverse the web, we leave a digital trail and through this trail, whether we like it or not, we weave our online identities or have them fashioned for us. Daniel Soloff put it well in his 2004 book, The Digital Person, in which he writes about the aggregation effect in these terms. Quote, the digital revolution has enabled information to be easily amassed and combined. Even information that is superficial or incomplete can be quite useful in obtaining more data about individuals. Information breeds information, similar to a Stirac painting, where a multitude, a multitude of dot, dots juxtaposed together form a picture. Bits and bits of information can aggregate and paint the portrait of a person. Questions about the nature of the digital identity being generated and who has access to them and for what purposes are being asked with increasing urgency and the answers aren't clear. Facebook has recently come under the spotlight for the fact that personal data from as many as 87 million user profiles was able to be accessed by their consulting company Cambridge Analytica with huge political consequences. Yet for many people, digital privacy is not even considered as a serious issue. It's just part of the culture of surveillance and security that's become normalized. The public outrage I recall at placing security cameras in the streets and squares of London following the terrorist bombings of 2005 quickly petered out as cities all around the world were doing the same. In that decade there was widespread paranoia about camera surveillance and also fascination as illustrated in the popularity of reality TV in the major series such as Big Brother an experiment in confining and observing social behaviours. In the guise of social responsibility and personal freedom, a decade later, mass surveillance on a scale beyond anything George Orwell imagined has become a part of many people's daily life, commonplace and endemic, leading to what has been described by Andrew Keane in his book, The Internet is Not the Answer, from 2015, as a catastrophe of abundance of personal data. As he puts it, quote, we are choosing to live in a crystal republic where our networked cars, cell phones, refrigerators and televisions watch us, unquote. Many of us will be with smartphones or devices 
will be aware of how location services ceaselessly seek to observe and, and track us. The story is not all negative. Online public spaces, paradoxically, can sometimes become a safe haven for personal expression, as though they were private, and yet within the supportive framework of the community to the wider world. Psychologists have studied how trauma, for example, can be spoken about and shared in online forums without the participants being constrained by long-held social conventions and taboos surrounding grief and expression. Others might wonder what there is to hide from. If Google can make helpful recommendations based on its knowledge of everything about me that it can gather and see, what is the problem? Even recent reports of health data being matched with patient purchase histories and driver safety records for companies to determine health insurance premiums is not enough to worry some people. It's just the world in which we live. This week in Australia, we learned that the Australian Bureau of Statistics, a government agency, purchased mobile phone data from the National Telecommunications Provider, Telstra, to map people movements in the Australian Capital Territory, where our capital Canberra is. It was able to purchase um, data that supplied gender and age information of people tracked, but it was apparently anonymised and aggregated. And yet we wonder you know, how well that's been done. And did any of us in Australia know about that? Or that that was being collected? People seem to seem happy to give up personal freedoms in exchange for all that the internet offers. Or help else have become so attuned to assigning away their rights that it appears as though there's no other choice. After all, corporate policies and government legislation often allow or even require tracking of actions and behaviours as a condition of the use of services. It's practically impossible to use an online service without agreeing to hand over information about your location, the products chosen, the links clicked, the time spent, and to consent for it to be reused for unspecified purposes at any time. Or at least this has been the case until perhaps until now when some of these new laws such as the GDPR law in Europe will, will encourage greater transparency. But perhaps it still won't be possible to use these services. It would just be uh, more apparent what they're actually doing with that data it won't be um, possible to use them without agreeing to these conditions. Harari's description of this state of affairs rings horribly true. I quote from his his book, Homodeus, quote, In the high days of European imperialism, conquistadors and merchants bought entire islands and countries in exchange for coloured beads. In the 21st century, our personal data is probably the most valuable resource most humans still have to offer, and we're giving it to the tech giants in exchange for email services and funny cat videos. <laughs> But increasingly, we may have little choice. Perhaps hiding is no longer possible. Issues of privacy versus freedom of expression and personal ownership versus public access plague legal systems worldwide. And never before has there been such a tension between the values of openness and the protection of personal privacy. Complicating this picture is that while we all use the web, in practice we experience it differently. While we're able to choose the manner and extent of our public presentation of ourselves via social media, much of what is mirrored back to us online is tailored solely for us based on our private information and personal search patterns. Whenever we log into computers, devices, web browsers or other online services, we have a personalised experience, unique, unique to our data footprint. The algorithms that drive the searching, recording and exchanging of information and personal data make it appear that we're being presented with convenient and timely recommendations that empower us to make choices. But this is only partly true. The fact that we search in particular ways for certain search terms and items has created a bonanza to the niche marketing. We're no longer surprised when we're being presented with just the products that we want 
and the sponsored advertising slots from the search for the web. But did you give consent for that information to be collected? How did they know? The fact is that the more time we spend online, the more data that is gathered about our preferences based on search, search patterns. And in the process, our online experiences become increasingly personalised and tailored to us. But it also increasingly entraps us in a web of our own making. This creates what, we, what are referred to as filter bubbles or echo chambers. The internet enables democracy, plurality and diversity in aggregate, but how many people actually experience that multiplicity of the world's experiences and ideas and knowledge? Knowledge indeed has been democratised in the sense that there's no longer the kind of mainstream that was created and maintained by mass TV and radio broadcasters and consumers massively receive news and information at the same time as one another. Yet, while the internet appears to offer liberation, it also sets up a self-perpetuating cycle and poses the risk that we could become so cocooned in our own customised digital version of the world that we only engage with certain tailored content and ideas which are a projection of our digital selves, fashioned by our desires, tastes and prejudices as they converge with those of global corporate empires. The amazing gift of free access to the world's knowledge makes us vulnerable to a predatory Silicon Valley culture that trawls through our personal lives for its own purposes. Harari puts it well when he writes, quote, we're sleepwalking towards a world run by algorithms and we should be very afraid. This beautiful book, Homo Deus, has the subtitle, A Brief History of Tomorrow. Technology may still be in our hands, but the tables have turned. Our space has been invaded and changed. Distance and arm's length engagement with the internet is no longer an option. But who or what is in control of our space and our identities, and should we be worried? Google and others seem to know us too well. Our interests, our desires, our fears, our taste in music, our political leanings, our histories. They remember things that we've forgotten about ourselves, or perhaps never knew. They know our secrets. For Harari, quote, the new technologies of the 21st century may thus reverse the humanist revolution, stripping humans of their authority and empowering non-human algorithms instead. And moreover, adding into this unstable mix, the vision of open and connected democracy bringing together the vast diversity of worldviews and lived experiences, while it suggests a world where we have a far greater understanding of humankind's plurality and diversity, has recently also led to polarisation, isolation and amplification of extreme and radical views. The mass human connectivity that appeared at the start to enable positive mass communication practices now threatens to destabilise the entire global social order. A 2016 Wired magazine article entitled Social Media Made the Arab Spring but Couldn't Save It looked back on the events originating in Tunisia in December 2010, which led to protests across the, the Middle East akin to, um, to social media to speak out against oppression, uh, inspire and hope for a better future and democratic future. This was the, this I'm quoting here now from the article, this was the, the idea to speak out against oppression. Comparisons were made with 1968 peace protests in the US and there was talk of a new democratic dawn. Yet as the author of this article, Jesse Hempel writes, quote, half a decade later, the Middle East is roiling in violence and repression Activists are being intimidated into restraint by governments that are, with the exception of Tunisia, more totalitarian than those that they replaced. Terrorists now visibly and routinely use the very same security encryption standards that were designed to protect individual privacy and to cover the tracks of criminals. We hear about this all the time. It's one of the most visible news items if you search for um, privacy and security on the internet. 
the dark web, as it's known, refers to content that exists on dark nets that overlay, that are overlay networks that use the internet but require specific software configurations or authorization to access. And in practice, this makes them inaccessible to the majority of people, but available to those who have the codes or passwords or use the services that are required to access them. A bit like an illicit criminal version of the virtual private network that many organisations, including universities, use to log into university systems from off campus. By some accounts, the dark web is thought to be around 500 times the size of the surface web. Somewhere in the middle is the dead is referred to, which also contains information that search engines can't index, such as medical records, government resources, and financial information. In the early web era of the 1990s, the digital environment was frequently depicted as a separate realm to be entered through a computer screen, but now, in many cases, it acts as an extension of our bodies. The words virtual and cyber once named a parallel space that set up the distinction between online and offline, but now for many people, there's no longer such a distinction between external and internal, or on and offline, with always on internet services. There's no longer a gateway to open or a barrier to cross. No longer a real world and a virtual world or any integrated one, and there's no distance between them. The risk of catastrophic data compromise or attack or revelation increases daily, not only because hackers develop new skills, but because we're ever more reliant on data systems, and so the impacts would be greater if and when they're compromised. But add to this reliance the increasingly intimate relationship between technology and the body that represents a further integration of human with the machine. Huge medical advances have taken place in the past decade, driven by de digital technologies, such as the implanting of microcomputer chips under the skin and the production of prosthetics by 3D printing. Readily available now in the mass market are body text, metric te textiles and other wearable electronics that react to changes in physiology. But these sorts of new and experimental techno technologies can plug us into a non-realm, human realm of perpetual interactivity between ourselves and digital devices and monitors, and blur, blur the line between human and non-human. Many of these things are not around us, but rather within us in bodies and sensory systems that surround us. The Human Cell Atlas Project aims to map 35, the body's 35 trillion cells and to decipher the types and properties of every cell, a project that will attempt to work out exactly what we're made from. But in what can be thought of as a sinister twist, Google's parent company, Alphabet, is at the same time encouraging people to donate their DNA for research purposes. In our time of rapid technological change, every day the news confronts us with stories of ruthless cyber hacking, rampant distortion and manipulation of political messages, and shocking breaches of digital personal privacy. At the same time as it points to the remarkable future possibilities for cybernetics and artificial intelligence that seem on the brink of becoming realities and promise new interrelations of human and machine in a better and more sustainable world. It's difficult to comprehend that many of the most transformational technologies that I've been referring to have only been developed in the last couple of decades. It was clear that Web2 and social media platforms had the potential to transform communications and to overcome the tyranny of, of distance in, in that arena. But what wasn't possible to know then was the extent to which the new frameworks would influence other aspects of daily life, including increasing participation in what would become vast virtual communities and ultimately uh, the way that, uh, that we live our lives on a, a macro scale. In this era of the digital aggregate itself, identity is not revealed but rather continually accumulated and assembled 
from scatter bits and pieces via search tools governed by principles that are non-human online, we are characterised by the data we produce and engage with. Harari sets this phenomenon into the broader historical context of the evolution of humanism when he writes, quote, at the beginning of the third millennium, liberal humanism makes way for techno-humanism. So where does all this leave us as humans today? Can we untangle ourselves from the web and take back control of our digital worlds? Can we recreate a safe and private space where we, where we won't be watched or manipulated? Can we re-establish a distance between ourselves and the teeming digital world? And do we want to? What are we to make of Ferrari's future vision in Homo Deus that, quote, humans are an assemblage of many different algorithms lacking a single inner voice or a single self, quote. Is this what we will inevitably become? Or is it just a warning to disconnect where we still have a chance? While digital technologies have given us ready access to proliferating stores of information that can help us better understand our world, they're also shaping it, influencing our thinking and our behaviour, and thus playing a role in constructing new kinds of identities for us, online and offline. And in the process, we've been reconfigured as human beings, as individuals and as citizens. Thank you very much.